a, um, a hand out here. You can take your Bibles and turn to 2 Chronicles 29. 2 Chronicles 29 is where we will be studying here this morning. There are many examples in our culture, as well as we're going to see in the Bible, of doing things the right way and the wrong way. My wife and daughters, a few weeks ago, came out of one of the uh, restrooms they had gone into and were laughing about a sign that they saw on the wall to show the right way and the wrong way. Now, I really hesitated to say, hmm, should I show this sign in church? But I just couldn't help myself because this was on, it was kind of in a bathroom, like I think it was at a uh, gas station. Something you don't expect to see on the wall was this sign right here. (laughs) To describe the right way and the wrong way to use the restroom. Now, we have examples in the Bible that describe many things. If you're wondering about that, in foreign cultures, um, they don't do things the way we do. So they do things different uh, than we do here in the United States. Um, Yes, (laughs) they do. And so anyways, um, there's examples of right and wrong. And we see that here in Scripture. We see the picture of what happens when we do things the right way and the picture that contrasts when we do it the wrong way. It begins even in the book of Genesis. If you think of the example of Cain and Abel, the very first two people born on this earth had the example of one doing it the right way and one doing it the wrong way and the consequences for not obeying God and not stepping out to do what God wants to be done. We're going to see this here as we continue our study, and we've seen it a few times, but that's the contrast between Samaria and the northern kingdom and Jerusalem and the southern kingdom. And we see a very different result compared to Jerusalem and Samaria in today's reading on whether they chose to follow God or not. I want to kind of uh, catch us up here on where we're at in our timeline. I don't know what I did with my pointer when we moved all this stuff around. Um, So let's see if I can, I can't find this even to point to you. Let's see, oops. Can't find my mouse on there. All right, but you can follow along and look here. Again, I don't have the pointer, but if you want to look in the top yellow part, um, a little bit over on the right, so you see the top yellow and the top, and then the bottom green. All the way on the bottom right is Hezekiah. That's where we're at in our timeline. Hezekiah has just taken over as the king of the southern kingdom of Judah. You see on the top, though, right there, the yellow ends. We're going to see that today. The end of the northern kingdom of Israel has been, uh, basically, we're going to see how it is is basically destroyed. And that's kind of our picture in our timeline today. The first thing I want to see here this morning is that religious worship should be a priority in our lives. Now, sometimes today, the idea of religion is looked down upon. Jesus himself rebuked the religious leaders. But religion in and of itself is not bad. We've talked about this many times. Religion is like a vehicle. It gets you to a point to get you where you need to go, but it's not the end in itself. The religious leaders were rebuked because they focused and they worshiped the religion rather than using the religion to help direct them to the one they needed to worship, which was God. We've talked about this again in the past, that we need to do things religiously in a sense of we do them on a regular, consistent basis. We place a priority on these things. 
And what Hezekiah does is he places a priority on the religious worship, the regular worship. He institutes it. He makes it possible because he sees the importance of it. And he does this by opening the temple. If you remember, his father Ahaz had shut the doors of the temple. They had developed their own way of worship that was contrary to the way that was presented in Scripture. 2 Chronicles 29, beginning at verse 3. In the first year of his reign, in the first month, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. Notice what it says, the first year of his reign in the first month, he opens the doors. Now that's a pretty big step to take. His father had completely shut the doors, completely destroyed the religious worship, and the first thing he does, he makes it a priority, is I am going to open the doors of the temple again. Now understand, it kind of a misconception, the temple and the church are not the same thing whatsoever. The temple, in those days, people did not walk into the temple. They had the courtyard that they would go into, but only the priests were allowed in the temple. But he made a priority in opening the temple doors. He allowed the priests to go in and restore the proper worship that God had described for his people. In the New Testament, I think we have a similar command or a similar idea of the priority found in Hebrews chapter 10. He says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as it is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. We get the idea here that we need to make worship a priority. We need to make coming to a religious worship service a regular habit, an important part of our life. We need to be meeting together to worship with other believers, gathering together and praising God's name, learning from Him. It needs to be a priority in our lives. Here it says, even as you see the day drawing near, it's very interesting what has happened over this last year. In fact, I was just telling somebody the other day, if I had to do it all over again last year, I probably would not have stopped having services here in the church. You know, this whole pandemic was new and everything, and we weren't sure what to do or how to do it, and so we paused for those six or eight weeks, and you just don't know of what's going on. But now that you've experienced, what I've seen is a lot of churches have stopped meeting or stopped meeting for a, a period of time, which I see Scripture says, look, as you see the day of the Lord approaching, what's going to happen? We're going to have more and more problems like we experienced with the pandemic. We're going to have more and more situations where the world and the enemy that controls it will want to stop believers from meeting together. But more and more, we need to see the need to gather together the importance of worshiping the Lord together. And notice he says here, is not neglecting the meeting together as the habit of some is. Some people develop habits of not going. That to me is one of the biggest detriments of churches that have not met publicly together in worship services for over a year, is people really get into the habit of not going. And it's important for us to gather together to worship and praise our God. So Hezekiah reopens the temple. Hezekiah also removed the evil, evil objects out of the temple. Look at verse 4. And he brought in the priests and the Levites and assembled them in the square on the east and said to them, Hear me, Levites, consecrate yourselves and consecrate the house of the Lord, the God of your fathers, and carry out from the filth the holy place. For our fathers have been unfaithful and have done what was evil in the sight of the Lord our God. They have forsaken him and turned away their faces in the habitation of the Lord and turned their backs. 
He says, okay, Levites, I want you to purify, consecrate yourself, set yourself apart, and go clean out the temple. Remove all these evil things. Turn from that. Take it away. New Testament reminds us of this. He says to put off your old self, which belongs to the former manner of life as is corrupt through evil desires. And be renewed in the spirit of your minds and put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. He says put off evil and put on righteousness. This is what Hezekiah is doing. He's removing the evil. A lot of people want to just add salvation or Christianity to their life. They want to keep living their own selfish ways, but add Jesus to it. Jesus doesn't say, hey, why don't you add me to your life? He says, no, if you want to be my disciple, you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. We talked the other week about you must repent, you must turn back. One of the things Hezekiah realized is that it was sin that had brought consequences to Judah. Verse 8. Therefore the wrath of the Lord came upon Judah and Jerusalem as he had made them an object of horror and astonishment and of hissing, as you can see with your own eyes. For behold, our fathers have fallen by the sword and our sons and our daughters and our wives are in captivity for this. He understood the need to turn from sin. He realized that it was sin that brought so much destruction. It was disobedience to God. He clearly understood that, and because he understood that, he emphasized the need to truly repent. We talked about repentance last week being that U-turn, going the opposite way. Verse 10, Now it is in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord, the God of Israel, in order that his fierce anger may be turned away from us. My sons, do not now be neg negligent, for the Lord has chosen you to stand in his presence, to minister to him and to be his ministers and to make offerings for him. What he says here, it says you need to take immediate action. Don't wait to cleanse yourself. Don't wait to purify yourself. Don't wait to clean the temple. We need to do it now. So he makes it a priority to worship God, but also makes it a priority to remove the sin from our lives. You know, that's what we need to do as believers when God reveals something to us. James talks about the Word of God being like a mirror. And when we see sin, it shouldn't be like, well, you know, that's probably something I shouldn't do, and I'll, I'll work on it. It's the idea of we can remove something. We need to turn from that and turn towards God. Verses 12 through 20, we won't read these, but the Levites and the priests, they cleanse and they purify the temple. And what was the result? The result was great joy. They placed a priority on worship, and the result from worship was joy. This is a message that you will hear me say over and over because when I was a kid growing up, I had the idea that if I chose to follow Christ, I would be miserable. I didn't understand what the real product was, was the security, the hope, the joy, the grace and mercy that God brings and that God has to offer and being able to live in that. What Hezekiah did is he offered sacrifices to the Lord. You know, often sacrifices are viewed as a negative thing. A lot of times when we hear the term, hear the term sacrifice, we think, oh, that means I've got to give up something I like or something I enjoy. And, and sometimes that's true. Things that are ours, and that's part of sacrifice. David says, I'm not going to sacrifice something that doesn't cost me. But we think of today as we celebrate Mother's Day. Think about the sacrifices that our mothers have made or that you as a mother have made. And yet if I were to talk to you about the sacrifices, you're not going to say, oh, 
It was so miserable to sacrifice for my kids. I had to get up every day to make them breakfast. I could have slept in all day, but no, I got to wake them up to give them to school. And we, we don't complain about that. It's often what you hear is the joy. I was so privileged. Yeah, it wasn't always easy to get up in the middle of the night to take care of, uh, of the children or to, to do all these things that involved in, in part of that sacrifice, but it's part of that sacrifice of joy. And here, as he made the sacrifice, verse 21, and they brought seven bulls, seven rams, seven lambs, and seven male goats for a sin offering for the kingdom and for the sanctuary of Judah. Judah. And he commanded the priests, the sons of Aaron, to offer them on the altar. He basically gave of his own things to start these sacrifices. Verse 24, and the priests slaughtered them and made a sin offering with their blood on the altar to make atonement for all Israel. For the king commanded that the burnt offering and the sin offering should be made for all Israel. If you see the example of Hezekiah have been reading and following along, you see that Hezekiah gave much of his own possessions to be willing to give as an offering, a sacrifice. He was willing to give it to God. And really, sacrifice is often the beginning of joy. To experience the fullness of life, before we get that, it often takes sacrifice. By the way, I do want to mention this. I have found that the more I grow in Christ, things that are quote-unquote a sacrifice don't seem like a sacrifice anymore. Sometimes when you have to give something up for God, it seems so hard to give it up, but after you do it for a while, it's just part of life, and it acts actually a joy, even though other people might view it as a sacrifice. And you have that being produced, is you have that joy that comes, and it comes after the beginning of sacrifice. So they start this out, and then Hezekiah stationed musicians to lead in worship. Look at verse 25. And he stationed the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals, harps, and lyres according to the commandment of David and of Gad, the king's seer, and of Nathan, the prophet. For the commandment was from the Lord through his prophets. And the Levites stood with the instruments of David and the priests with the trumpets. Then Hezekiah commanded that the burnt offering be offered on the altar. And when the burnt offering began, the song of the Lord began also. And the trumpets accompanied by instruments of David, king of Israel. The whole assembly worshipped, and the singers sang, and the trumpeters sounded. And this continued until the burnt offering was finished. Notice that along with the offerings, the sacrifices that are being made, there are songs of worship and praise being sung and given and declared unto the Lord. We're reminded of the importance of this in the New Testament, where he says, And be not drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to, your, to the Lord with your hearts, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we sing when we gather together at church. That's what they did in the Old Testament. And it is for us as we encourage one another and our hearts are uplifted as we sing about and think about our great God. So we see they start to sacrifice. They start to sing praises to God. We see that Hezekiah led the people to experience this great joy of worship. Verse 30. And Hezekiah, the king, and the officials command the Levites to sing the praises to the Lord with the words of David and of Asaph the seer. And they sang praises with gladness, and they bowed down and worship. So they offer sacrifice, they sing songs, they realize their heart condition before God. They bow down, they worship Him, they praise Him. Verse 36, And Hezekiah and all the people rejoiced, because God had provided for the people. For this thing came about suddenly. You have great rejoicing in Jerusalem. 
They're sacrificing. They're worshiping God. They're following the law. They're doing everything that God wants them to do. And what's the result? Not misery, not pain, not suffering, not heartache. Though sometimes when we follow God, we will experience those. But ultimately, there's this deep joy that just comes out. And it's so important that we choose to follow God and choose to sacrifice and choose to worship Him because the end result of obedience to God will be joy, will be a fullness. You see this many times in the Old Testament, this rejoicing when the people are doing what's right. Now, if it was so great... And so wonderful to follow God. Here's a question. Why didn't they do it all the time? Now I'm going to give you a quick illustration to kind of illustrate this. Several years ago, I was working really hard at my physical conditioning. I was trying to, I was training for a race. I'm not sure what race it was. I, I worked really hard. I watched what I ate. And I felt great. And I remember thinking at that time, why don't I do this all the time because I feel so good? And now here I am 10 plus years later and thinking, I wish I would have done that all the time because I don't feel near as good as I did back then. So why, when I think about that, how good I felt? Because it was, it was hard. It took work. It took effort. My natural desire is not to wake up in the morning and get up and bounce out of bed and say, yes, I want to go running today. This is so much fun. Now, there are a few people who like that stuff. Crazy in the head. Just crazy in the head. People who love to get up and just to go run. I do it because I have to. And I, I don't have that desire. Uh, it's hard. This morning, I walk into my living room or the kitchen area, and I see this plate full of these beautiful-looking donuts. Mm. Now, my wife had asked me if she wanted me to buy some. I said, don't buy any for me. But I saw those. Man, I wanted to grab one. But I already told her I wasn't going to have one, so I couldn't take one. Because it's hard to resist those things. And we get the idea to say, well, well, why weren't they always following God? Because they were sinful creatures, just like we are. And you experience the joy and rejoicing when you follow God, but at the same time, it's easy to be lulled into sleep spiritually and thinking, oh, I can just enjoy the little pleasures of this life rather than following God, and you don't experience the fullness and joy that God has to offer when you allow that sin to come in. It's really part of active and willing daily choices. Am I going to be obedient to God? Am I going to see God? Am I going to experience his greatness? Or am I going to give in to what my flesh wants to do, whether it's sin or worry or fear or abandoning what God has for me? And we see this in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is worshiping and praising God and they're exalting God and there's joy and wonder going on in Jerusalem at the same time. What was taking place in Samaria? By the time this was taking place, basically Samaria, much of it had gone through some great heartaches and destruction, destruction, or were in the middle of a lot of it. But we see that here. Turn over to 2 Kings chapter 17. We're going to see the contrast. We see Israel, who is, or Jerusalem, who is doing it the right way, led by Hezekiah, and the result is great joy. We see Samaria, who is living in sin and selfishness. And we see the result of that as a lack of worship led to the destruction of Israel. 2 Kings 17, verse 1. In the twelfth year of Ahaz, king of Judah, Hoshea, the son of Elah, began to reign in Samaria over Israel, and he reigned nine years. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, yet not as the kings of Israel who were before him. So he wasn't the worst king of Israel, but he was still evil. 
So if we look here again, it talks about the idea. So it says in the 12th year of Ahaz, Hoshea. So if we get uh, our, bot, our timeline here, again, I can't point it uh, with a pointer, but you see Ahaz and Hezekiah in the green, and you look up on the top yellow, and you see Hoshea there um, and what they're going through. Now, originally it was 722 B.C. that the Assyrians originally come, and we're going to see in a moment they besiege the city. What happens is God causes the fall of Samaria. Look at verse 3. Against him came up Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, and Hoshea became his vassal and paid to him tribute. So what happens is he comes up against him and says, Look, I'm going to attack you and I'm going to destroy you unless you pay me money. It's kind of like the idea of blackmail, blackmail today was tribute in those days. Basically, you pay me a large tax of what you have or I'm going to destroy you. Verse 4, But the king of Assyria found treachery in Hoshea, for he had sent messengers to the king of Egypt and offered no tribute to the king of Assyria as he had done year by year. Therefore the king of Assyria shut him up and bound him in prison. So let me explain this situation here that we see. Um, if you look on your map, this is an area, or this is a map of um, the area here. And what you have uh, is you have, um, oops, there we go is up on the top here where it's darker green. That's kind of the area of Assyria. And they came down to attack Judah. You see Judah right in the middle of the yellow there. And in the bottom here, you have the Egyptian kingdom. Judah was right in the middle. And so was Israel was right above Judah where you see the word Samaria there, if you can read the smaller writing. You see Samaria there. Assyria comes to attack Samaria. And as they do that, what happens is Samaria asked Egypt for help. And because of that, Assyria got really upset, and they decided, look, we're just going to take the city. And it says they set up a siege around the city. Now, for three years, it says the city was under siege. We've explained this before, but I just want to get you the idea. When a city was under siege, what would happen is the armies would come and they would surround the city, often setting up an encampment, and try to starve the people inside the city into surrender or it would take that three years to build weapons to destroy the city. In fact, very interesting, if you go over to Israel today and go to a place known as Masada, it was a, a fortress on a hilltop, and you go there, and if you look here over to the right, you see that kind of big square, and then kind of, it looks like a little city, the remnants of a city. That was an encampment, basically, by the Roman soldiers that they set up, and they stayed in, while the city of Masada was under siege. So basically what they would do is they would set up fortresses around a city and just wait for the city to starve, and the people inside the city would try to outlast them or wait for help. And so here it describes that the city of Samaria was under siege. Verse 5. Then the king of Assyria invaded all the land and came to Samaria, and for three years he besieged it. Verse 6, in the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria, and he carried the Israelites away to Assyria and placed them in Hala and on the harbor, the river of Gozam, and in the cities of the Medes. What happens is they invade, they conquer Israel. Samaria is destroyed. They take almost all the inhabitants and spread them throughout their empire. Basically trying to destroy the Israelite nation. Verse 7. And this occurred because the people of the Lord had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, 
and had feared other gods and walked in the customs of the nations whom the Lord drove out from before the people of Israel and in the customs that the kings of Israel had practiced. It declares why, in fact, much of chapter 7 declares the sins of the people and why God chose to judge them. Verse 22, the people of Israel walked in the sins that Jeroboam did. They did not depart from them until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight as he had spoken by the servants as prophets. So Israel was exiled from their own land to Assyria until this day. You see, Jerusalem is rejoicing because they're worshiping God. Samaria is being destroyed because they live in their own selfish deeds. And God allows the land to be taken over. Verse 24, And the king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Kuda, Ava, Hamath, Seraphim, and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the people of Israel. And they took possessions of Samaria and lived in its cities. If you look here on the map, you see that purple part called Samaria. That was the area, even in the days of Jesus, Samaria was a mixture of Israelites and Assyrians or people from all over, and it started at this point. What they did is they brought a bunch of people to live in the land of Israel to basically diminish the nation of Israel. Yes, Judah still existed and would exist for another hundred years. And God would have spared them longer, but they chose to sin as well. In conclusion, I want you to ask yourself these questions. First, is religious worship a priority in your life? Do you make it a habit to attend a service, a church service, not just attend, but to truly worship? Do you make it a habit to spend regular time in God's Word and studying His Word? God wants you to worship Him as a priority in His life. He wants to be first. Secondly, are you experience the joy that true worship produces? When we truly sacrifice, when we truly surrender, when we truly live in obedience to God, you'll be amazed the joy that it produces. It seems so odd to us because the thought is how you like or enjoy or that your flesh wants to do ultimately bring about something good. But you see it all the time. When we're willing to give of our selfish desires of things that probably aren't the best for us and to seek after what's better. The result is joy. If you don't live a life that's full of joy, most likely it's an indicator, one, that you're not being led by the Spirit because the fruit of the Spirit, one of them, is joy. But it's probably an indicator that you're giving in to some of your selfish desires. The world kind of teaches us the more you give in to yourself, the happier you'll be. But really, the more we give in to ourselves and our selfish desires, often the more miserable we become. When we surrender and submit, that's where we find the true fulfillment. Lastly, are you headed towards the path of destruction? You have those choices, those daily choices. Am I going to do things God's way, the right way? Or am I going to do things man's way? Am I going to be like Jerusalem who experienced the great praising of God, the wonderful worship? Or am I going to be like Samaria who lived for themselves and experienced destruction? I want everyone to bow your heads and close your eyes. Before we sing our closing song here this morning, I want you to take a moment just to let God speak to your heart and life. Let his word make a difference.